So uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. We humbly pray that we may live before you in righteousness and purity forever. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, so we are hopefully finishing up um, this second cycle. Then we'll move into the third cycle of uh, today. We'll pick up uh, Zophar and uh, Job's uh, reaction. And we are kind of building to a conclusion. So I know you can't see it on the outline yet, but after we're done with this section, I'll move everything on up. And then you'll actually start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. But hang in there. We, we've got some good discussions going to be taking place uh, now. So let's begin with Job chapter 20, verse 1. Then Zophar, the uh, uh, Namathite, thank you, answered and said, Therefore, my thoughts answer me. Because of my haste within me, I hear censor that insults me, and out of my understanding, a spirit answers me. Mm. Okay, so I want to unpack this one for a moment here, for a good reason here. Uh, let me just focus on his thoughts, okay? He does name haste, so that means... Thoughts are coming fairly quickly, okay? And he's got a sense of urgency behind all of this, to which I will immediately say, if there's a sense of urgency, sometimes my thoughts are not always very clear, okay? He's going to be reacting to Job's previous comments. He's going to take them personally. That's a good thing. Uh, but then here's the scary part. Out of my understanding, a spirit answers me. There are many spirits in this world. Okay? You have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit's going to come from God's Word. Okay? Now, I will admit, Job is now God's Word, but at the time of this, one has to ask, what kind of spirit is speaking to you? Is it the spirit of the world, or is it the spirit of God? problem comes in is we're talking about his thoughts and his thoughts hastily. At this point, I'm having a bunch of red flags being waved in the back of my mind that says you got to use a lot of discernment because this is not, this may not be, and it will not be uh, the Holy Spirit speaking, which again then says, okay, what spirit is driving us? And it, it is the spirit of the world who is not connected to Christ. Uh, so just keep that in the back of your mind as we uh, continue to go through this. Um, I know we're going to start, that starts off on a very negative note, but that's the way the speech starts. So let's continue on with verse 4. Do you not know this from of old, since man was placed on earth, that the exulting of the wicked is short, and the joy of the godless but for a moment. I, you know, I'd love to agree with this and go, amen, uh, when I'm looking at this compared to all of eternity. I can agree to this, but I don't have a little asterisk and a disclaimer that says that he is saying this is just in the grand scope of eternity with God. Our life is but a moment. He's looking at the things of this world, and now we have a different uh, discussion here. Because when you look at the things of this world, uh, do I see the exalting of the wicked a short period of time? The answer is no. Uh, do I see the godless uh, having joy but for a moment? Um, again, the answer is no. And Job is going to react to all of that, but let's continue on. Uh, verse 6, uh, through his height, 
uh, mount up to the heavens, though his height mount up to the heavens and his head reach to the clouds, he will perish forever like his own dung. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? He will fly away like a dream and not be found. He will be chased away like a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will see him no more, nor will his place any more behold him. His children will seek the favor of the poor, and his hand will give back his wealth. His bones are full of his youthful vigor, and but it will lie down with him in the dust. So a couple things here. When we're talking about the wicked here, because that's kind of their main thing, is that, Job, you're wicked. This is why God is punishing you, okay? And, you know, and so uh, he's trying to make the case, as he's continuing to make the case, that the, the, the evil people will just perish away, okay? Um, and he uses a very interesting poetic expression, like their own dung, okay? Uh, but yet, we have to ask, have you ever heard of families of wicked people? Yeah, where it somewhat does pass down to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, okay? And it almost seems like some of those families of wicked people do well for themselves, including down to the next generation. Uh, but now that, huh? I'm sorry, did I? No, I was going to say, you've got lots of wicked families. You've got mobsters and right. you know, they train them from generation, or abusers train them from generation to generation. It's just an ongoing, horrible. Yes. Um, and it, it, like in today's world, you would have, like you were naming the kind of like mobsters of the mafia or uh, even like uh, drug gangs. And again, continuing to perpetuate uh, the the evil evilness. Uh, that's why we call it organized crime, and it sometimes does pass on to the next generation. But keep that next generation in mind as we go to verse ten. His children will seek the favor of the poor. So now we we could be talking about generational of evil families, okay? But now. It could also be taken a different way. It could be taken that the sins of the parents will then be passed on to the children, okay? Because it's going to be basically saying the children will seek the favor of the poor. So basically, you know, dad rose up with tons of riches and now his children are going to be suffering the consequences of dad's action. And then the further punishment is that uh, his hands will give back his uh, wealth. His bones are full of youthful vigor, but it will um, lie down with him in the dust. So again, you have this idea of the children being punished. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because Job will address that later. And so um, uh, Zophar is basically saying, yes, the evil are punished in this world, Job. This is why you're suffering. Let's continue on with uh, Zophar's poetic uh, comments. Um, let's see. Okay. Twelve. I'm sorry. Twelve. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, though evil uh, is sweet in his mouth, though he hides it under his tongue, though he is uh, loth to let it go and holds it in his mouth, Yet his stomach is turned in his, yet his food is turned in his stomach. It is the venom of cobras within him. He swallows down riches and vomits them up again. God casts them out of his belly. We've got a couple of different images going on here. First of all, the first uh, opening words in verse 12, I want you to think of having a sweet tooth, okay? Yeah. But instead of uh, coveting uh, chocolate, or candies, or uh, other whatever is your fancy, so to speak. We're coveting <coughs> evil. So evil is like the sweet in his mouth. And you're like, wow, okay. Uh, you know, you hide it under your tongue, okay? You know, let it sink in slowly, you know. So I don't know how many of you do that with uh, sugars or candies, just sort of Consume it slowly, just let it hide under there and let it soak in. Uh, but um, yet it's going to uh, turn his stomach, so to speak. Yet his food is turned into his, in his stomach. 
Um, it is the venom, venom of cobras, and we're going to pick up uh, that little bit of that a little bit later on. Um, within him, he swallows down riches and vomits them up again. Okay? And now you have a little bit of... Um, it's, it's almost... Now, now, here's kind of the fun part, where he's now saying, who's the active agent here? God casts them out of his belly. And I want to bring this up here for a reason, because Job is really struggling with the idea that I didn't do anything really evil. I'm not evil, okay? And I would agree with Job on this. But he's then he comes to the conclusion that God is doing this to me, okay? Fair enough. God is allowing it to happen to him. Satan is the actual active agent, but with God's permission. So uh, it's funny that Zophar actually picks up the deity here, that God casts them out of his belly, that God is going to be the one that is going to be punishing the evil, to which I sit there and go, okay, I like that, uh, that idea here, but let's continue on. Again, he's going to be talking more about um, the evil people. Uh, poetically saying, verse 16, he will suck the poison of cobras. Hey, what is he doing? He's going after poison. The tongue of a viper will kill him. Now, I will admit, with that one verse, it almost sounds um, uh, opposed to one another, uh, that how can you suck the poison out of a viper, but yet a tongue, of, uh, a poison out of a cobra, but yet the tongue of a viper will kill you. I'll let it sort of go, but let's focus on 17. He will not look upon the rivers, the streams flowing with curds and honey. And the reason I put that in an underline is I want you to think in the back of your mind, flowing with, I should say, honey and curds. I think I said curds and honey, but, and the reason why is that's typically a promise made by God for the promised land. Okay, and what's really neat about this, if you understand it that way, that yes, the wicked are not going to be looking at the, the rivers and the promised land, but that promised land has not yet been articulated. If you follow the idea that Job is a contemporary of sorts of Abraham, because the promise was given to Abraham, okay, he was starting to hear that promise by God. Job is in another part of the area, but not necessarily privy to that promise. At least that's part of my theory to all of this. But let's continue on. He will give back the fruit of his toil and will not swallow it down from the profit of his trading. He will get no enjoyment, for he has crushed and abandoned the poor. He has seized a house that he did not build. Now, again, when you're talking about the wicked, um, I see them enjoying in today's world the fruit of their toil. Um, I see them enjoying an awful lot, okay? Uh, so again, a little bit of that question, who are we really talking about? But let's go on to verse 20. Because he knew no contentment in his belly, he will not let anything in which he delights escape him. Uh, verse 21, there was nothing left after he has eaten. Therefore, his prosperity will not endure. In the fullness of his sufficiency, he will be in distress. The hand of everyone in misery will come against him. To fill his belly to the full, God will send his burning anger against him and rain it upon him into his body. He will flee from an iron weapon. A bronze arrow will strike through him. Strike him through. It is drawn forth and comes out of his body. The glittering point comes out of his gallbladder. Terrors come upon him. Wow. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, we're being very poetic, poetic here about saying this. The evil will really be punished. Okay, but let's uh, let's have a little bit of fun with the contentment. Um, because that's always a big thing. Can Christians be content with what we have? And especially if we find ourselves in the position of Job. Everything's taken away. Our bodies are now causing us pain. We have tons of sores. We're in misery. And can we still not say that God is good? Okay, because God is good. 
Okay. Uh, but referring to the evil, there is no contentment. And I do like the second line. Uh, he will not let anything in which he delights escape him. Which basically, you do see this in the premise of uh, people with evil. If they see something they really, really want, they're going to go after it and acquire it. Plain and simple. Uh, but yet, uh, we also invoke God again. God will send his burning anger against him and rain it upon him into his body. Again, uh, Zophar is basically saying, Job, this is why you are suffering. You are evil. Okay, and invoking a little bit of God language in all of this. Okay, let's go on to verse 26. This is uh, then finishes up the section here of Zophar. Utter darkness is laid up for his treasure. A fire not fanned will devour him. What is left in his tent will be consumed. The heavens will reveal his iniquity and the earth will rise up against him. The possessions of his house will be carried away, dragged off in the day of God's wrath. This is the wicked man's portion from God, the heritage decreed for him by God. Okay, so again, we're still trying to figure out with Zophar, are you talking about the here and now with the evil and the people <clears throat> suffering? Or are you talking about God's judgment at the last day because it somewhat looks like he's blending a little bit of the two before. But notice the fire, a fire not fanned will devour him. That means it's a big, huge fire to begin with, okay? Uh, you do have the tent being consumed, um, and the heavens will reveal his iniquity. Now, that's an interesting line of thought that as Christians, I think we need to unpack. Will the heavens declare my iniquity? If you ask people on the last day, Will all your sins be revealed? What do you think their answer will be? They're forgiven. Ooh. And I think also people think that there's going to be a video of everything they've ever done. You okay. Know, it's going to be there for all to see. So let, let's unpack this. So the world's natural reaction is, yep, I'm going to be accused of all my sins. And I've got to make atonement. i got to pay off all my sins. But yet we just heard also from uh, uh, our response that we are forgiven. Christ paid them off. So will there be a revealing of every single sin that I have done? No. no. Okay. I know we have until eternity but to go through them all, but no. The great accuser, as Scripture describes Satan is overthrown in the book of Genesis. But notice how Job 1 began with the devil being the great accuser. Okay, so uh, the devil will be overthrown. So if there's no one accusing, <coughs> as Jesus said to the woman caught in the ask, uh, aspect of adultery in John chapter 8, you know, where are your accusers? There aren't any. Okay. So notice uh, Zophar says, heaven is going to reveal. I'd like to see another proof text for that, and you're not going to find it. So as I look at the scriptures, and as the scriptures reveal themselves, we do not see the heavens making a nice long laundry list of every single sin that you have done. Now, it does talk about the evil will be accountable for their actions. Why? because they have rejected God's grace and mercy. So if you rejected God's grace and mercy, you're basically saying, I will take on these actions myself and pay my own price for it, which is eternal death and damnation. Wanda? Isn't there also a part, though, where we're going to be um, rewarded for our deeds? And Correct. He's going to bring forth, like, yeah, I opened the, I wanted you to do this, but guess who had to do it? No. <laughs> okay. Yes. So um, we will receive a crown of righteousness. The that that is the reward of the gift of faith. Um, and so uh, you and I think this is where you're going. That is the opposite of the heavens revealing 
the iniquity. Okay. Um, actually, if you continue to uh, go to that passage you were thinking about, where um, the righteous on the last day says, Lord, when did we do these things for you? And the unrighteous <clears throat> would say, Lord, when didn't we do these things to you? The, the answer that Jesus gives is, it's already obvious by your action in today's world. So when it comes time for Judgment Day, it's not a revealing of the facts. That has already taken place while you're here on earth. What's going to be happening on the last day is those facts are already obvious. It's now going to be obvious to the world because we don't always know people's uh, hearts and thoughts and actions. And it's already obvious, I'm just going to be separating based on your own action. Do you believe and trust in Jesus Christ? Yes. Eternal life. If you reject Jesus Christ, then the answer is join Satan with the great accuser. Um, let's pick up the last part. Uh, this is the wicked man's portion from God. Ooh. The heritage decreed for him by God. This almost seems to imply that God purposely created people who are wicked. Okay, some people will actually twist this idea to that. Uh, the answer is God does not purposely create you um, wicked so that you end up in hell. God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus Christ dies on the cross for the sins of everyone, including Zophar, including Job and you and I, and everyone in the whole world. So the, the, the wicked will get what they deserve because of their own actions, okay? Not because God decreed that they are wicked and uh, they, uh, deserve eternal death and damnation. However, God, if I could use this phrase here, God has decreed and given a heritage for those who believe and trust in him. So we talk about, as Christians, how we are declared righteous because of Jesus Christ. We know we're sinners, but yet Jesus dies on the cross, and now God the Father looks at us and says, you are now holy. You are saints, okay? We are declared righteous. We are adopted into God's family, and we are given a heritage. So this is true, that God will decree a heritage for those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ, but not for the wicked. For the wicked, it's just you, because you have rejected God's grace, you don't have the gift of eternal life, and by your own actions, you're going to be uh, with Satan in the depths of hell. So, uh, having a little bit of fun with Zophar's words at the end, uh, again, he's trying to use these words to attack Job and saying, Job, you're just a wicked man. This is why you're in pain. This is why you are suffering. To which you probably want to say, thanks be to God. Hmm. And you're sitting there going, wow, this is terrible. So let's get into Job's reaction because Job kind of says the same thing. Verse one from chapter 21. Then Job answered and said, keep listening to my words and let this be your comfort. Bear with me, and I will speak, and after I have spoken, mock on. <laughs> okay, so I want to I want to compare and contrast uh, two lines of thought here. First of all, Job is basically saying, I'm going to bring you words of comfort. What you have spoken are not words of comfort. I'm going to bring you words of comfort. And that is the message of God. He wants to bring that word of comfort. Sometimes he has to bring a hard word in order to remind us, wait a minute, God's ultimate role is God is love, okay? That's what God wants to be identified as, if I could use a word in today's vocabulary, okay? God wants to be identified as a God of love. 
But sometimes God works of what we call in his alien work and a work that he doesn't want to do. And yes, you will pick up the God's wrath also. But Job already says, I'm going to speak these words, but you're going to continue to mock me. So what are these words of comfort? So let's start unpacking them. Verse 4. As for me, is my complaint against man? Why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be appalled. Lay your hand over your mouth. When I remember I am dismayed and shudder seizes uh, my flesh. So Job starts off and saying, my complaint is not against man. It's really against God. And he's getting a little impatient. Why shouldn't he be impatient? Mm. Remember, Job doesn't always get things right, uh, but yet at the same time, um, if your complaints with God, I would just be very cautious and say, let's just let God answer in God's time. And he will in about another 20 chapters here. <laughs> Uh, but basically, let's pick up verse 5. Look at me and be appalled. Lay your hand over your mouth. You know, that was going to be the reaction. That was what Job is waiting for from his quote-unquote friends. Can you just look at him and just say, nothing? Okay, just put your hand over your mouth and just be appalled that your friend is in this type of case. Uh, because then Job says, um, I'm dismayed. I, you know, I, I sort of shudder at looking at myself. Verse 7. Why do the wicked live, reach old age, and grow mighty in power? This is kind of the answer uh, Zophar's comments earlier. Their offspring are established in their presence and their descendants before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, and no rod of God is upon them. Their bull breeds without fail, their cow calves, and does not miscarry. So let's start at the beginning here. Uh, why do the wicked live, reach old age, and grow mighty in power? So this is to go against uh, Zophar's uh, comment uh, that... Uh, Job is wicked, and the wicked uh, only lasts a short period of time, and Job is like, no, they don't. Yeah. Uh, now he's starting to pick up the offspring. He's going to name it a little bit later on in 17, 18, 19. Their offspring are established in their presence, their descendants before their eyes, so that multiple generation of family evils. It seems like their houses are safe from fear. No rod of God seems to be against them. Okay. They seem to be prospering very well, that even their bull breeds without fail, their calves, uh, calves, and there's no miscarry. So every year they get more abundance. Uh, verse 11, they send out their little boys like a flock and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and the lyre and rejoice to the sound of the pipe. They spend their days in prosperity, and in peace they go down to Sheol. They say to God, depart from us. We do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Oh, so let's have fun with this. I have two lines of thought here. One is that continuing the prosperity of the wicked and the flourishing of their families, uh, singing, rejoicing, and in the midst of the rejoicing and peace, they go down to Sheol. They don't even realize it. Okay. They, they, they die, quote unquote, in peace with all this joy, with all, this, all these good things and so forth. But here's the killer, so to speak, the true killer. They say to God, depart from us. We do not desire the knowledge of your ways. If you hang on to verse 14, it is teaching us that prosperity is not based on righteousness versus unrighteousness. Okay? Even the wicked will then come to the conclusion, this is what makes them wicked. Okay? Money is not the issue. So if you see someone prospering, they could be evil, but they also could be good. What really makes a person evil? They say to God, depart from us. They rejected God. And they don't desire 
to learn more about God. That's what makes them evil. Job is really saying, this is what makes people evil. But what does Job want to know? Job wants to know the answers. Job is inquiring of God. Why? He's not rejecting God. He wants to know more about God. Remember, he made that bold statement uh, a couple weeks ago. I know that my Redeemer lives. Um, you know, the great Easter theme. Uh, but at this point, uh, so Job gets it really, really correct. Prosperity is not a difference between righteous versus the unrighteous. Unbelief is the rejection of God. Verse 15. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we get if we pray to him? Behold, is not their prosperity in their hand? The counsel of the wicked is far from me. Okay, so let's first start with 15. Uh, what profit do we get if we pray to God? What profit is there for being a Christian? So if someone asks you, Oh, why do you, why are you a Christian? How would you respond? What do you hope to gain from it? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. Okay. Um, so do you hope to gain all the riches while you're here on earth? No. I wouldn't mind having a little extra from time to time, but, you know, the goal for the Christian is not to the things of this world. We know this world will perish. Faith is that only gift that we can, that carries us into eternal life. Um, so, you know, picking up kind of on that theme, behold, uh, is not their prosperity in their hand? Are we thinking, think, thinking of earthly prosperity or heavenly prosperity? And that's kind of the, the key difference. Those who are righteous, those who are connected to Christ, we're thinking heavenly. Those who are thinking of the things of this world, um, those are, are the wicked. And so he comes to the conclusion, the counsel of the wicked is far from me. I'm not the wicked that you are perceiving. His friends are standing right there and they're not so... The counsel with his friends is certainly not um, on the right side of things because it's it's he there on the wicked side. You're right. So you, you've so got... it's not far from him. It's right next to him. <laughs> <laughs> you, you sort of picked up on that poetic Hebrew uh, part to this. And we're yeah, we're talking with some verbal slams here. And this is, you know, when you start unpacking this verbally, these are some real, <clears throat> real talks and real attacks verbally with one another. And again, I go back to that idea that uh, Luther raised, um, is that he said when he is attacked by people, that's when he can write. And he wrote many magnificent things. And I can only imagine he must have really been tacked. But if he's at <laughs> peace, you know, he has no reason to write. And so, you know, God, I would have to say, raised up these friends of Job so that as Job is wrestling with it, he can sit there and say, this is wrong. And so then this must be right. And that's where Job is going with all of this. But let's uh, continue on. I uh, got a couple more uh, lines here. Verse 17 how often is it that the lamp of the wicked is put out, that their calamity comes upon them, that God distributes pains in his anger, that they are like straw before the wind and like chaff that the storm carries away? Okay, so how often do we see the, the wicked snuffed off? <laughs> Not often enough. Thank you. Thank you. How often does calamity come upon them? Same thing. Not often enough. That God distributes pains in his anger. Be careful with this one. Every sin we commit is against God. And if Jesus didn't take away the pains of God's anger, 
then you're sort of implying every time you 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 sinned, you would get a little zap from God. <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost like those electric fences they use for dogs. You know, you go past the boundary, <laughs> you get zapped. Could you picture going through life that way? And remember, you can sin by not what you do, your thoughts, your words, and even your thoughts. Can you just picture a bad thought entering your mind and all of a sudden you get zapped? <laughs> I wouldn't. Oh, no, no, we won't even talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be zapped all the time. It, yeah, you'd, I'd be a nutcase. Oh, so thanks be to God, he doesn't do that. And this is why we appreciate, love, and cherish our Savior who does take away the pains of his anger. But now, let me just, to help teach this a little bit more. Remember, your body does tell you, sends that signal of pain as a beautiful warning that says, hey, if you touch a hot toaster, what's going to happen? Ouch. You know, as a little boy, I remember, you know, you got the hot oven. And what do you tell little kids? It's hot. It's hot. Don't touch. But eventually the little kid has to go out there and touch to find out what the pain of hot is, right? and then hopefully learns the lesson that don't do this again, okay? What happens if the pain, if for some reason that your body did not ever learn the message of pain? Mm. You could find yourself in serious trouble here and not even realize it, okay? So having a very high pain threshold may not always be the good thing. Because if your body's trying to send signals to you that something's not right and you're ignoring it, that may not be good. Keep that in mind when you have the wicked in today's world and their conscience is so numbed by the things of this world, they don't even realize they're, what they're doing is wrong. They don't care about it. They are just setting themselves up for eternal destruction. But the Christian conscience creates pain upon the soul whenever we, quote-unquote, go past that electric fence of sin. So there's a certain time and purpose where this can actually serve us of having that pain of our conscience that says, this isn't right, don't do this. So um, is God really distributing that pain, so to speak? Ultimately, all our sins are paid for by, uh, by Jesus. God's wrath is poured out upon Jesus. Does God allow the conscience to bring about this pain for some discipline and correction? The answer is yes. But as we are feeling the conscience and the pain of this world, it's not because God is pouring out his wrath and punishment upon us. It's for the purpose of correction and remind us to return to him. And as you're gonna find out in this weekend's sermon, uh, to refine us, to get rid of the impurities within us, like precious metal that is refined by fire. Uh, that's part of uh, this weekend's message as we also celebrate the rite of confirmation at all three services. So in whatever service you go to, there will be a confirmation act. Awesome. Yeah. But let's uh, continue on here. Now we're going to get to the children. Verse 19. You say, referring to what we were talking about earlier, God stores up their iniquity for their children. Let him pay it out to them that they may know it. Let their own eyes see their destruction. Let them drink the wrath of the, of the Almighty. For what do they care for their houses after them when the number of their mouths is cut off? Okay, so first of all, let's go to the children. Um, you say God stores up uh, their iniquity for the children. Uh, the answer is no. Job rejects this theory. Um, and I do like the idea that, you know, if I did something wrong, I should be made aware of it. Okay, and that's where the conscience comes in. Uh, let him pay it out uh, to them that they may know it for correction purposes. Okay. Uh, let them see with their own eyes their destruction. But if you think of the wicked continuing to prosper, 
and becoming more and more powerful, they don't see it. Their consciences are numb, okay? And Job is kind of a pleading and saying, yeah, they, they don't see it, okay? Maybe they should see it. Uh, let them drink the wrath of the Almighty for the uh, wicked. They will finally at the last day. Um, and then all their houses will be cut off. Okay, let's go into verse 22. Will any teach God knowledge, seeing that he judges those who are on high? Let me just first start with that question. Who can teach God anything? No one. There's no one more higher than God, okay? So this is definitely a rhetorical question with the answer being no. Will any teach God knowledge? Uh, no. Verse 23. One dies in his full vigor, vigor, being wholly at ease and secure, his pains, pails full of milk and the marrow of his bones uh, moist. Another dies in bitterness of soul, never having tasted prosperity. They lie down alike in the dust and the worms cover them. So what's the difference between a rich person who dies and a poor person who dies? They both die, okay? <laughs> and as Job says, the, the worms cover them. The worms will consume them. It doesn't matter whether they had all the things of this world or they had absolutely nothing. Death is the great equalizer, so to speak. Okay, remember, you can't take it with you except for the gift of faith that you do take with you. Uh, so... Uh, so death comes to the good and bad alike, but thanks be to God, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he has defeated death for us. We will not die, but we will be raised from the dead and live with God for eternity. Verse 27, Behold, I know your thoughts and your schemes to wrong me. Okay, so Job's going to name it. For you say, where is the house of the prince? Where is the tent in which the wicked live? Have you not asked those who travel the roads? And do you not accept their testimony? That the evil man is spared in the days of calamity? That he is rescued in the day of wrath? Okay, so there is no guarantee of justice in this life. Let's just put it that way, okay? Often the wicked flourish until death, okay? And, but yet they are buried with great honor, great monuments, okay? Um, this is what we see even in today's world. Verse 31. Who declares his way to his face and who repays him for what he has done? When he is carried to the grave, watch is kept over his tomb. The, the clods of the valley are sweet, to him, all mankind follows after him, and those to whom and those who go before him are innumerable. How then will you comfort me with empty nothings? There is nothing left of your answers but falsehood. So Job's conclusion to Zophar's comment is you're comforting me with nothing. Okay? And basically what you're doing is just basically lying to me, okay? Uh, there, uh, the prosperity ends in the grave. The key is the gift of faith. And Job kind of, Job actually names that. Uh, not quite as directly as I just said it, but, you know, basically to Zophar's comments, you have no comfort for me. So I'm in all this agony and you're bringing me Worthless, worthless words, or as he says here, empty nothings, just to reinforce how nothing your nothingness is. Okay, so just want to give you an idea of what's coming up next. Uh, we're getting to the third cycle, which is the last of the cycles. And notice this one is a little condensed. We only have Eliphaz and Bildad. Uh, Zophar must have been silenced at that point. <laughs> Uh, with the uh, empty nothings. But then we get into Job's monologue, and notice that's going to take us um, four chapters. Elihu. Ooh, new person coming onto the scene here. 
Where did he come from? He's been in the background. And he's got a few chapters that he wants to speak. But then, under D here at the bottom, Yahweh's two speeches and Job's two responses as the next section into it. So again, we're, we're seeing the, the end on the horizon. But just as a reminder, uh, next week we are um, not meeting. I have a, a meeting uh, at the district office, uh, but we'll be meeting the week after it. I do want to share one interesting thing before uh, we close. It was actually part of my devotion that I read from another person. If I can get to it. Yeah, there we go. Um, from yesterday. As we're talking about the resurrection of the body, and as with Easter, uh, people will have some of these questions. So let me just start reading through some of this. What will my body be like in heaven? This question is half right. It is not bad to ask what the resurrected body will be like. But as usual, we humans get stuck on the wrong issues. What will I be? Will, will I be big, small, young, old, beautiful, or ugly? Will I recognize my husband or wife, children, or parents? As usual, we ask the wrong questions. We are focused on external appearances, as though going to heaven is like the ultimate makeover show, a show starring me. Okay, I love that little analogy here. Okay, what will I be like in heaven? I can't wait. Except for Christianity is not about what you do. It's about what Christ does for you. But let's continue on. Our heavenly condition is not a question of cosmology. Cos no, cosmology. cosmology. Yeah, okay. Uh, what you said. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. The beauty of the heavenly life given by Christ will be God himself, not us. And that beauty will not be merely physical, for we shall be like Christ. We shall partake also the divine gift of a beautiful mind and soul. We grope for this in our homey truisms. Beauty is only skin deep. Pretty is pretty, uh, pretty is as pretty does. I never heard that one before, but that's okay. Uh, the greatest beauty in the world was the beauty of the Son of God, whose appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness, coming from Isaiah 52, verse 14. Through marring self-sacrifice, Christ lives the most beautiful life. Thus his wounds are yet visible, though glorified, this too is a mystery that the marred person is the most beautiful. We shall have eternity to contemplate it. And he goes on, but that's kind of all I want to get to for today, just to kind of challenge our thinking here. As we just got through talking about the resurrection of the dead, we know that we are going to be raised. And again, we do have all these human questions. What will I look like? Will I know everyone's name? And so forth down the line. But we got to remember, it's about Christ, not about us. And uh, our connection to Christ makes us holy, not what we look like. That doesn't make us holy. So, again, just a little food for thought as we're in this Easter season talking about the resurrection of the dead. Let me just reassure you, you will not be disappointed. You're not going to sit there and get to the resurrection of the dead and, and be in eternal life in paradise and sit there and say, you know, I don't look as good as I thought I was going to, <laughs> Jesus. Will you do something about that? You will be beautiful. And you will understand the beauty, true beauty, that comes from Christ and Christ alone. Okay, so let's uh, close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.